it's my great pleasure to introduce our first speakers, uh, the Save the Elephants organization. Um, as I mentioned, there's this incredible crisis going on with ivory poaching, over 100,000 elephants poached over three years of a population of maybe 500,000. And Save the Elephants is one of the organizations leading the charge to conserve elephants. They're widely recognized as the most uh, scientifically advanced elephant conservation organization. They were the ones who, through their scientific research, first alerted the world to this current ivory crisis that we have. Um, because of their long relationships, uh, working for over 40 years internationally, they know the, the people that can get the job done. They know what the strategies are. Uh, together with the Wildlife Conservation Network, we've created the Elephant Crisis Fund and to date have raised over $4 million, all of which goes to support targeted strategic action in the field for conservation. So they are, in my opinion, one of our best hopes for the future of elephants. So it's my great uh, pleasure to start off by introducing uh, Frank Pope. He's the Chief Operating Officer of Save the Elephants. Uh, he actually started off in the marine world, did a degree in marine biology from the University of Edinburgh, and was uh, a marine conservationist and the marine correspondent for the New York Times. And um, through some very serendipitous path, he ended up in, in Kenya working on elephants, and I'll let him tell you that story. But it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce our first uh, speaker of the day, Frank Pope. Thanks, Tally. One hundred thousand elephants killed in just three years in Africa between 2011, 2010 and 2012. This is a problem that's too big for any one individual or organization or even nation to solve on their own. And without this international action, we stand to lose elephants from the wild within a generation. But if we can pull together a global coalition of everyone to address the poaching in Africa, to stop the trafficking of ivory by organized crime, and to reduce the demand, we can stop this. In order to be successful, we're going to need everyone, including you, to join this movement. And if you do, then you will be part of this coalition and part of the solution of one of the big conservation issues of our time. Now, I'd like to sketch out for you today briefly where we are with the, with the ongoing battle for the elephants um, and specifically what Save the Elephants is doing about this. Um, but first, I need to tell you a little bit about why I'm standing in front of you here today. Uh, as Charlie mentioned, I, uh, uh, I'm, well, I'm obviously a Brit. And I grew, up, um, I grew up in Oxford, in very civilized England, but my heart was, was elsewhere. I wanted, I wanted wilderness, and I found that wilderness in the ocean. And I saw many wonders in the ocean in my time there, and I also saw a lot of horror. I saw seabeds scarred by trawls. I saw reefs dynamited by selfish fishermen. I saw fertile waters devoid of life. But there are the bright spots, there are these wonders. And I had a, a revelation one day uh, about 10 meters down in the Bristol Channel outside of England when uh, I was um, uh, doing a story on Britain's first marine nature reserve and a, and a seal swam up to me. And I was, uh, I was delighted to see the seal and I had a photographer with me and I was ready, trying to get in the picture with this, with this seal. And uh, he wasn't, she wasn't playing ball. But eventually, I felt this tugging on my fin, and I turned around, and there she was. And she came very close to me, and even slightly too close. So I thought, well, wait a minute, and I, uh, this is getting uncomfortable. I put my hand on her chest to push her away. And instead of, I thought she was going to flinch and, and disappear. Instead of that, she, she felt my hand on her chest, and she folded both of her fins on top of my hand. And then she lay back in my arms and closed her eyes, and I just... I was totally in love from that moment on. <laughs> and in a place as vast and mysterious as the ocean, it helps to have a fellow mammal there to, you, you know, you understand them, they're air-breathing, milk-giving, highly social 
creatures. And much like whales, you feel this sort of shared intelligence and this link across the millennia that separate you. Well, I then met a girl. And uh, I, she, she took me to Kenya for the first time about 10 years ago. And that trip um, changed my life because there I met elephants for the first time. Now, I did have a slight advantage because the girl that took me there um, was probably the best person to introduce anyone to elephants in the wild because she'd grown up with elephants, having been raised by the man who first studied them in the wild. And Ian Douglas Hamilton was a man that I'd studied when I was doing my zoology degree, so I couldn't imagine anyone better than his eldest daughter to uh, introduce me. I then had the good fortune to marry Saba uh, <laughs> a, few, uh, a couple of years later. Um, Saba is very comfortable around elephants, and um, in fact, I remember having my first close encounter with elephants, which was slightly too close for comfort for me. Once again, I was a little bit out of my comfort zone, and I stared an elephant in the eye for the first time, and that's where I really felt that same linkage, that same introduction into a landscape and, and their, this, shared, this shared intelligence. And that, that carried me from the ocean into their landscape in Samburu, and I suddenly realized that here, was the whale of the land and, and a wilderness I could really identify with. And that, the focus of my life then shifted to elephants, and I feel enormously fortunate to have found them. So where we work as Save the Elephants is, is in Samburu in northern Kenya, uh, which is a place that Ian chose to study elephants back in 1993 when he started Save the Elephants, because the elephants there are so tame and trusting. They are despite all the troubles that, that they've met in the, uh, in, in, the, in, in the wider landscape. They live in a, you know, we're up close to the Somali border, close to South Sudan. Um, it's a troubled landscape, but the elephants in this national reserve are enormously tame and trusting, and that gives great opportunity for us as researchers to get a deeper understanding of them for, for humanity. And we... Um, so the, the reason that they are so tame and trusting, one of the big reasons they're so tame and trusting is the people of Samburu. And this is David Dabalan, who's the head of our field research. And David is one of the Samburu people. They're a nomadic people. And these guys have a really deep cultural connection with elephants. They don't traditionally hunt elephants. Uh, there's an enormous respect going back for millennia. And as a result, we've been able to work with them to develop a conservation ethic for the, for the 21st century. And that's enormously important, as, as we're going to see. Conservation is all about the people that share the landscape with these animals. Well, Save the Elephants has been there and had been studying the elephants there for 15 years. And suddenly, in 2008, our intensive monitoring program detected a problem. Poaching was on the rise. And our known elephants were getting killed, and that's enormously disturbing. But also, the overall statistics weren't good, and in that year, births suddenly exceed, uh, deaths suddenly exceeded births, and, and we had a population that was now in decline. So, brace yourselves. This is what it looks like and the impact on a, on a family. The, um, I'm going to skip over that because it's just too awful. We published a... We published a warning in Nature, um, the journal Nature about that year, saying, if this is happening in what is one of the world's, well, one of Africa's best protected areas, in a country that's relatively stable, this might be a terrible harbinger of what's to come for the other er protected areas around East Africa. And unfortunately, that's what came to pass. And this crisis has now unfolded. It's swept like a wildfire across Africa. And I'm just going to pick out a few of the spots. This is Nyasa National Park in Mozambique. Uh, it's a vast area the size of Massachusetts. And we're lucky enough to have with us today in um, 
at WCM, a lady called Colleen Begg, who runs uh, uh, the Nyasa, Nyasa Carnivore Project. We were out whale watching with her uh, last week. And while we were on the boat, she got a message from her husband, Keith, saying that gunshots had once again been heard from their research camp. This is close to their research camp, and there's a lot of other area there that's also afflicted. She, gunshots had been heard, and she said, that's another elephant gone. This year alone, they've lost 500 elephants in this park, 500. Just to the north of Nyasa is the Sulu National Reserve, National Park in, in Tanzania. The Sulu is another huge area, and it too has been afflicted by poaching. We started hearing that there was industrial level poaching, but we had no idea, we had no way of ascertaining quite how bad the problem was until the end of last year, there was a survey that discovered that 67% of this population had been lost in the last four years, 67%. It's terrible to have these statistics, but they are absolutely crucial for getting action. And once you've got solid science, you can then persuade governments to do something about it. And I'm glad to say it does seem like the Tanzanian government is now sitting up and taking notice, and this credible survey that it did was the start of that process. The forests are even more devastating, the news that's coming out of the forests. We have Gabon, which is one of the most conservation-minded nations in Africa. They've got a wonderful leader who's designated lots of national parks. Um, they are home to two-thirds of the remaining forest elephants. But forest elephants as a whole have lost two-thirds of their population in the last 10 years. Two-thirds of the forest elephants are gone. Minkebe National Park in Gabon lost 11,000 elephants in under a decade. In the Central African Republic, um, no, sorry, in the, the Congo Basin has been largely emptied of, of, of elephants. Um, and research has shown that this kind of killing has, is actually changing the very structure of the forest. It's not just losing elephants. The ecosystem is starting to change. The balance is out of whack. And this is happening as some of the trees, many of the trees, are, are, their seeds are only dispersed by elephants. So we're seeing the forest change under their feet. So we have these statistics rolling in from, from Africa, this terrible news rolling in from across Africa. Um, in the late 70s, there were 1.3 million elephants estimated to remain in Africa. Now, we don't know. There is a pan-African census going on right now uh, that's trying to get a better handle on the numbers. We think there's about 500,000 remaining. Um, but these statistics can make you numb. And when you lose an elephant like Koitalel here, it all comes slamming home again. Koitalel was a um, a young bull in his prime in Samburu, known well to our researchers. Uh, he's named after a, a great Kenyan chief who led a rebellion against the British in, uh, in, uh, over a century ago. He was gunned down just to the south of Samburu National Reserve, uh, and we had a terrible morning tracking his last hour of agony and the blood sprayed on the ground, and eventually he found this tree and he'd, we could see on the side of this tree where he'd jammed his tusk into the tree to try and keep himself upright. And then the scrape of the tusk against the bark, and he debarked it as he collapsed to the ground and died. Community rangers actually got there in time to watch him die, but there was nothing they could do. They laid an ambush for the poachers, but the poachers had got scared and already left. It's very easy to vilify the poachers in these situations and think it's all a problem of the poaching. If we get the poaching licked, then all will be solved. But in fact, behind the poachers lies the traffickers. And those are the guys that are getting fat on this situation. These are the guys that are behind the problem. These are the guys that are profiting from it. They're buying ivory, raw ivory in Samburu for about $100 a kilo. That ivory according to research that we sponsored this year in China, is currently selling for $2,100 a 
in China. That's an average raw price. That's not a top price. So that's a 200% profit that these guys are making. And those kind of profit margins are luring in organized crime, even terrorists, to this trade. And that is another key area we have to address. Um, and we're seeing evidence for this organized crime involvement in the, in the figures. Traffic, which monitors the illegal trade in wildlife parts, uh, has detected more large-scale ivory seizures last year than there have been at any other year in the last 25 years. So what are we able to do about it? Well, when we first started this, uh, when, when we first detected this problem, we, um, we started linking arms with our partners in, in northern Kenya. We said, right, okay, let's hold the line here. And with the, the wonderful work of the Northern Rangelands Trust, which run a community conservation scheme across the north of Kenya, with a security for Lewa Wildlife Conservancy with the, all the county councils and the Kenya Wildlife Service, we, we, we started shoring up our defenses there. Meanwhile, we started talking to all of our partners and leveraging Ian's five decades of experience on the ground across Africa and asking people, what is going on? What can we do? What are the facts? And then taking this information to the corridors of power in this country and elsewhere and saying, this is the situation. This is how serious it is. Let's do something about it. But along the way, we realized that we needed something else. We needed some glue for our coalition. We needed, we needed a way of getting finance to the most effective groups who are doing the most urgent projects. And that's how the Wildlife Conservation Network came up with the idea for the Elephant Crisis Fund. And that is something that we have built with the Wildlife Conservation Network. And it, it's... Uh, proved an incredibly effective tool for us to change the situation on the ground. And now I'm going to take you through a little bit about what we're doing with the fund. Um, the very first intervention that we made when, when we established the fund was when we heard of trouble in what is the greatest place in the world to see forest elephants. And this is Zangabai in the Central African Republic. And this is a magical, magical clearing in the forest, this by where, where there's been a long-term monitoring project that recognizes the individual elephants. Uh, it's a World Heritage Site, but the rebel militia that stormed in there didn't recognize that, um, and they didn't hold back, and they killed 26 elephants within the by uh, in very short order. Well, in very short order, we responded. And within 24 hours, we had sent $150,000 to the Wildlife Conservation Society, who then dispatched a team led by explorer Mike Fay, who some of you might have heard of. Now, Mike Fay was cru crucial for this because he had links within that rebel militia. And he and his team were able to turn that situation around, and that stability is held until today. The team, the, guy, the poachers went in there with rocket-propelled grenades. That's, how, that's what we're up against in Central Africa Republic. So this is a map of where we're at with the crisis fund. Okay, we set off a year ago. We said, let's try and raise and disperse $5 million within three years. Let's get this out to the most effective conservation organizations uh, across Africa and across China and change the situation. Let's take on the poaching. Let's take on the trafficking. Let's take on the demand. Well, a little over a year later, We've raised $4.1 million of that, and we've supported 20 different organizations in their efforts. Anti-poaching is the first of these areas that we're involved in. And of course, rangers are absolutely critical to this. So is air support. And this is uh, the Savo Trust aircraft. Now, Savo is one of the great elephant populations. It's one of the most iconic elephant populations, largely because you get these huge tuskers. But they were in trouble. And the Kenya Wildlife Service was desperately short of serviceable aircraft. So we funded the Savo Trust to run joint operations with them. And every flight they do, they have a Kenya Wildlife Service ranger in the back. And all their operations are tightly integrated with, with the Wildlife Service. And that's making an enormous difference. Some of you may have heard of Satao, who was one of the biggest tuskers left in Savo and perhaps even in, in the whole of Africa. In May this year, he was killed uh, with, with a poison arrow in Savo. 
And this news spread like wildfire across the world. It was a, a global outpouring of grief, and, and rightly so. But what we have to remember is that Savo has other great tuskers of his magnitude and other ones coming up uh, who wouldn't be there today were it not for the efforts of the Kenya Wildlife Service and their partners, the Savo Trust. So we've put, we've put about $500,000 of the crisis fund towards that so far. In Nyasa, we've done a, a similar thing. We've said, right, let's get, let's get aircraft into the sky. And we funded the Wildlife Conservation Society to put aircraft into the sky to get smart patrolling across this huge area. Um, so we've supported enhanced ranger monitoring and, and deployment. And that's starting to bite. It's a huge challenge there because, um, because of the area and, and, and the desperate situation of, of Mozambique. In the forests, we need really deep partners in the forest because this is a, um, uh, this is a, a place that if you, if you haven't got the deep roots and the experience, then you're not going to have an impact. So there are a few places in the forest where there are strongholds that remain that we can defend. And so we've selected these places uh, to shore up their defenses. And, and the first of these is in Gabon, in Ivindo National Park where we've supported uh, the National Parks Agency of Gabon uh, to, 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 to increase ranger enforcement there. We've also funded uh, the Lukuru Foundation in the Tutu Basin in the Congo uh, to do the same thing there. And what happened there was that it was a funding gap. They had, a, they had, they had funding organized, but they, they didn't have funding for a three-month gap, and they were going to have to send the rangers home. That would have been open season. So with very little to do, the crisis fund could step in and say, no, don't send your rangers home. Here's provisions, here's food. Um, and finally, in Cameroon, in the southeast corner of Cameroon, in the Tridom area, which is um, an area that we know from our uh, DNA and isotope testing um, being conducted on seizures, we know that this is one of the main areas that ivory is, is uh, leaving Africa from. <clears throat> there, we funded the World Wildlife Fund for Nature to um, uh, boost the park management and range of forces there. We have another secret weapon. Uh, and this is something that's very close to Save the Elephant's Heart. And uh, it's something that Ian pioneered the development of back in the 60s. And that's radio tracking of elephants. And originally, this was done for pure research. And, and it was just uh, a way to lift the veil on their secret lives and say, OK, well, how are elephants making their decisions? What's, uh, what routes are they using? And so on. Um, and it was almost accidental that we suddenly realized that the people we were sharing this tracking data were using it to guide the deployment of their patrols. And we've now built on that and developed that. And now we have 100 elephants, around 100 elephants across Africa being tracked. And this is just uh, our small area around Samburu. This real-time data is feeding into a command and control center and is the first thing that these security managers say they check in the morning. Where are the elephants? Where do we need to send our people? It's been enormously successful. We've rolled it out in the Masai Mara, and we're now looking to take it into the Sulu and Virunga in the Congo and elsewhere. So there is hope in this picture. Chad, which was one of the previous hotspots of poaching, the, 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 the pressure has declined dramatically. Babile, elephant sanctuary in the, in the northeast of Ethiopia, right up next to the Somali border, that was in terrible trouble. We sent a team there, and we found out that, that there were 200 elephants remaining there. That's just about viable. So we decided to team up with Born Free and fund the Ethiopian Wildlife Authority to boost efforts there. And now uh, they've, arrest, they've already arrested one of the, the poaching kingpins in the area. And morale, having been rock bottom, is now sky high. There's now hope for that population. Um, and of course, in Samburu, um, we have uh, we've had the coalition that we've pulled together is, is, is biting. That, uh, the, the linking arms that we've done there has, has had effect. And we have um, seen the principal indicator of poaching fall in that area. And for the first time since the crisis began, we've seen births exceed deaths in that population. So 
So we know what to do. Now it's a case of scaling it up and getting it up out elsewhere. That formula won't work everywhere, but we know there is hope. Now taking on the traffickers is a very thorny problem. And one of the things we can do there is to, is to help law enforcement agencies in their efforts. And one of the things that's used around the world to assist law enforcement is sniffer dogs. So we thought, right, OK, let's help them catch more smugglers with sniffer dogs. But before sending dogs out to Africa, we, th we, we were talking with our, our partners, the world Working Dogs for Conservation, who are represented here today. And they said, look, just wait a minute. There may be problems here, because we think too many dogs are being sent to Africa, and they're not being properly handled, and they're not, they're not being, having enough ongoing training, and there may be problems. So we funded them to conduct a quick review. And sure enough, they've come back. And thank God we didn't send lots of dogs, because there's, there's lots, of, lots of issues. But we now have a roadmap forward for actually getting effective deployment of sniffer dogs across Africa. Um, the other thing we can do is go back one step further and actually work to strengthen the law itself. In Kenya, for example, in 2013, we sponsored a study to say, how bad is it in, in Kenya? We think, it, we think it, it's probably not very good. We think that people are spending thousands of dollars catching poachers and smugglers, turning them over to the, to the courts, only to find that they're released. And sure enough, that's what was happening. Of the people found guilty of wildlife crime, in Kenya, only 4% were being jailed. The maximum fine dispensed was only $320. That is no disincentive for a, an ivory crime syndicate that's making many times more that on every transaction. So we funded Wildlife Direct, a, a very effective conservation organization in Kenya, to sensitize magistrates and, and train prosecutors. and um, and indeed work to strengthen the wildlife law in Kenya. And sure enough, last year, uh, earlier this year, in fact, uh, a new wildlife law was put into place in Kenya. And that law upped the maximum fine to life imprisonment and a maximum fine of $230,000. That's proper, that's proper disincentive. And um, we're now funding an ongoing courtroom monitoring program to make sure that magistrates know that they have eyes on them and that, and, and that we know what's, what the outcome of, uh, of these cases are. And that's one example of doing it in Kenya. And, and uh, now we've done that trial, and, and we're working with partners to see how we can roll that effective transition out elsewhere. Um, which brings me on to the final and the most crucial thing we need to do, and that is reduce demand for ivory. Because if we don't reduce demand for ivory, then all of our other efforts will go by the wayside. All the places that we thought we'd secured will be under siege from poachers once again. And all of the crime syndicates that we thought we'd repel from being involved in the ivory trade because it was too risky, they will be lured back in again. So at this point, I'd like to introduce um, one, of, one of our team, one of the Save the Elephants team, um, Rasson Kantai Duff. Now, Rasson is, uh, is one, truly one of the WCN family because WCN sponsored her to uh, to, to go to Oxford University to do her masters, uh, her conservation masters. And um, she returned to Kenya, and she's now leading our education aware and awareness activities. Uh, she's a conservation weapon in herself, and um, so we dispatched her to China earlier this year. And at this point, I'm going to turn the storytelling over to her. Uh, Rasson Kamtaida. <laughs> for 70% of the world's illegal ivory and is currently fueling the slaughter of thousands of elephants across Africa. Unfortunately, most people don't know the complexities of the trade in China. Without this information, 
we risk vilifying an entire nation and may lose the battle to save our elephants. I've been to China, and I believe that we can begin to understand who the buyers of ivory are, and then share our awareness with the right target audience. Instead of denigrating China, let's join the growing force of Chinese willing and waiting to fight for our elephants with the same passion and vigor that we do. Together, we can win. Together, <laughs> together we can remove the main driver of the killing of elephants. So I'm here to tell you about what the Elephant Crisis Fund is doing to reduce demand for ivory. But first, I'd like to tell you a story about China from my experience. Guangzhou, Xiamen, Quanzhou, Fuzhou, Beijing. These are the names of the five cities where one of the first China-Africa youth dialogues on ivory trade began. I was fortunate enough to be among two Kenyans and one Chinese who organized the trip, Yu Fang Gao. And we went to speak to various audiences within China. And we went there to find out what people were thinking about ivory trade and about elephant conservation. But I also went there because I wanted to show audiences what it means to lose an elephant which to Kenyans and to me personally represents my very national pride. It, it defines our cultures and engineers our landscapes and steadies the backbone of our economy. Now, I have to admit that although, uh, despite my educational background, thank you WCN, um, <laughs> And, and all these, these things that I've been able to be part of, I was rather skeptical about what the response to our talks was going to be. Let me hyperbolize it for you, and maybe you'll, you'll identify with me. The Chinese have long been depicted as bloodthirsty consumers, either totally ignorant or totally numb to the cruel effect of the ivory trade. So when I went through, I, I, I kind of expected to find towers of shop upon shop and story upon story of, of ivory in markets. So what did I find? <laughs> when I, let's start by talking about the people. When we went to China, and when we spoke to people, at the end of our talks, we were embraced by an army of middle-class youth and children who were interested and who were eager and who wanted to know more and to, to help us with this problem that we had. These people, many of them, did not buy ivory at all. In fact, they didn't even have friends who consider buying ivory. What about the markets? The markets were very different from what I thought that they'd be. When I walked into Guangzhou market, I saw shops with agarwood and shops with jade and amber, and there were also shops in that market which had ivory. In fact, I didn't even know I was in the ivory market until I reached the second floor. And then I realized. So this gave me faith in one thing, that the market can go on without ivory. If China made the ivory trade illegal, this market would be fine. But elephants would walk away and they'd be safe. So then it also gave me new energy to focus on a new group of people who were trying to consume ivory. And these are the people who the, the Chinese middle class youth that we met were telling us about. These are the suddenly rich people. They are the Baofahu, the, the bourgeoisie, if you would. 
And these people are buying ivory everywhere that they can. And they may number less than 1% of the Chinese population, but they hold Africa's elephants in their hands. These are the people that we need to reach. The Elephant Crisis Fund has funded Esmond Bradley Martin, who is a longtime ivory researcher, and he's come up with a startling, startling fact that these people who are buying ivory on the black market and gray market and legally and all these, all these markets combined have managed to triple the price of ivory in four years. This is what we're up against. Meanwhile, the, poacher, the price to the poacher has quadrupled. So what do we do about all of this? Well, I'll start by saying what we don't want to do and what we are not doing. We are not pointing fingers at an entire nation. We know that only a small proportion of people are buying ivory. And out of almost all the people that I met and all the people who have come to see us in Samburu, as soon as they hear about all of these things, they are compassionate and they want to help. So together, so what we, what we don't need is an enemy. We need a friend, we need a leader. And in order to build this leadership, we need to share awareness with as many Chinese as possible, as fast as possible, so that they can take action to fight for elephants. So the, the Elephant Crisis Fund, along with the African Wildlife Foundation, have been funding WildAid. And WildAid is an amazing NGO, and they have been doing an ivory campaign. This campaign has aired seven, almost 7,700 times in China last year. And this translates to nearly $15 million of pro bono broadcast value. So things are moving. And you see a wonderful picture of Yao Ming. Uh, Yao Ming, who we love, has, has been championing this battle for elephants. And he has um, also launched a movie in August in Beijing called End of the Wild. And hopefully it'll be coming to places near you too some, at some point. But so we're, we're hoping to see what this, this is going to do and how many people are going to, to see this and pass this on. The International Fund for Animal Welfare as well, has been reaching out to key opinion leaders. And these people are very important. And if we reach out to them, we can inspire them to fight for elephants and to become ambassadors for elephants. So this is one of the projects that the Elephant Crisis Fund is working on. Um, the last thing is that we also want to make sure that the dainty and delicate Li Bingbing keeps saying no to ivory on Chinese social media called Weibo. Now, you and I might not know who she is, but millions and millions of Chinese know who she is, and they love her. So I want to show you a little bit about what she has done and who she is, so you can love her as much as I do. I am a actress. I actually come from China. As the ambassador of UNEP this time, that's why I came to Kenya. I think there are many This is the head of the elephant. Wow. And the tusks actually come out of here. So 
these are the tusk cavities. So the tusk wow. comes out of this great big hole and it comes all the way out here like that. Wow. And so if the tusk is taken, it can be taken by killing the elephant. She was speared, probably with a poisonous spear. She walked and this is where she chose to come and die. Later on when she died, you know, the whole face was removed. This is one of 50,000 elephants that have been killed in the last two years. That's what we know. It's probably many, many more. People cry for them. I just feel so sad. It's really... <sighs> Too tiring. Today I came here to see the real world. It's like this. 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 整个象群也会在因此的许多年里处于崩溃的状态。你知道，你其实有能力改变这一切。没有买卖就没有杀害，请帮助我们，让更多的人了解真相。This is how we are using people who want to help us from the inside. And this is how we want to reach out to hearts and minds. But another important approach is a legal one. So we know that from many studies that have been done that many people, many of these Baofahu who are buying ivory are buying it for investment purposes. Which means that if we can get or if there can be a domestic ban on ivory in China, this would really have a huge impact on those people who are buying it for investment. So Yao Ming is working to, to work for this. He's, he's doing several things and he's delivering petitions to various sectors to forward this. And the Elephant Crisis Fund is also working with the Natural Resource Defense Council. And they are having their Chinese lawyers look at things and talk to Chinese policymakers and see what precedents can be set for a new dawn. So there is hope. I think, I hope that everybody feels hopeful at this point. And that let's join forces and let's pass this test because the future of these lovely elephants is in our hands. Thank you. I would, like, I would like at this point to introduce somebody who needs no introduction at all, um, but who is, well, I think a father and a grandfather to many of us conservationists who love elephants. And I first met him when I had no idea what a zoologist did. And I went to the African Elephant Specialist Group and he told me to not be afraid of, of elephant biologists. And through that, I managed to talk to many and to be inspired by many. And this is just my story and I know hundreds have had stories and will have stories and will be inspired by this elephant man. <laughs> Introducing Dr. Ian Douglas Hamilton. You just brilliant. I've got nothing left.
you, you can't imagine how inspiring and life-enhancing it is for us to come once a year to meet with you all. I feel it so deeply. And also to have this new generation to go on. At times, it's very, very hard with the elephants. We see them going down. But I have hope. I just want to tell you a little bit about that figure of 100,000 elephants. This is not just a figure tossed out in the air. This was the result of long, hard slog of peer review and behind it all, people out there in the bush and the forests, rangers who were collecting data often at the risk of their own lives. There are bullets that fly, there are widows that are created, there are orphans. There is immense human suffering as well as the side of the terrible killing of the elephants. You've heard this range of disasters and the places with it hope. Basically, in southern Tanzania and Nyasa, we have one of the real poaching hotspots. Again, in the Tridom areas of Central Africa. And as Frank mentioned, it's the DNA evidence that is showing this, a new technique that is localizing where these hotspots are. The good news is elsewhere. In Botswana, as yet immune, where the present loves elephants, they have money, they're an open, honest society, and the president uses the army to combat the poachers. There are still some 200,000 or so elephants living in Botswana. In the north of Kenya, we're also incredibly lucky at the collaboration that we live with day by day, where actually NGOs can work together and can work with government. And we rely on the umbrella of security that we have from Lower and the Northern Rangelands Trust. And we're able to put our scientific expertise into enhancing that and making it work better. Now, on an international scale, I truly believe that the science was the fundamental cause that drove the present awareness on the elephants. And starting with painstaking, unsung work, it reached the corridors of power through the Senate Foreign Relations Committee in America, through the intervention of Hillary Clinton. And I've just come from New York, where we had a meeting of the Clinton Global Initiative. And I'm delighted to share with you that there is a new African-led initiative. It's called the Elephant Protection Initiative. And it was started by Botswana, Gabon, Chad, Ethiopia, and Tanzania. <laughs> Two of those countries have the largest stockpiles of ivory in Africa. And it's incredible that the political scene has shifted so far that these nations agreed to forego any commercial use of ivory for the next 10 years. Now, you may say, well, it should have been a total ban. And yes, we would love that. But this is a pre practical reality of where we are. So I don't want to say much more because I've kept you, we've kept you here. I'm so proud of this young generation that are going forward. I'm so happy at the growing awareness we've had across the world that the CGI, the Clinton Global Initiative, was matched by a, a conference in Botswana, that the CITES Treaty has moved forwards, so that there was another conference in London, and that African nations are now um, uh, willing to pledge themselves, lead the way, and hopefully get the support they need from the world. This isn't the first time we've had an elephant crisis. That's why it's been so hard to see it happen again. But we did beat it before in the late 80s. There was a period of recovery for most of Africa uh, for 20 years. 
We can do it again with your help. So thank you very much for being here. <laughs>